So, um, hello everyone. I'm Kwang Gyun, a PhD student at Kite Visual Media Lab. And today I'm gonna present about guided image in painting with stable diffusion. As you can see from the title, uh, what I'm gonna cover today is present in this presentation is about stable diffusion and um, using stable diffusion to do uh, image in painting or image acting. So this is the table of contents for today. So first I will briefly explain about stable diffusion and then I'll review two papers that is related to image and painting and editing. So let's start off out with stable diffusion. So does everybody know about stable diffusion or ever heard about stable diffusion before? Yes, I guess most people would have heard about stable diff diffusion from now for now. And uh, stable diffusion is a text to image generation model um, using a diffusion process. So when you look up into the Wikipedia and search for stable diffusion, it states like this. It's a deep learning text to image model released in 2022. I think the most important part is that it is released in 2022. So that's important to keep in mind. And it primarily is a um, image synthesis method by giving a text prompt. So for example, um, if you give a text prompt um, as a dust bather uh, riding a dirt bike in the woods, you will somehow generate a images, something like in this uh, figure in the left side. And upon this text to image generation, you can also do tasks such as in painting, out painting, or even um, image to image translation with given a text prompt. So do everybody know why stable diffusion became so popular these days? Uh, not only because of the generation process, um, generation quality, but it's, it has to do with something that I have um, said. The model is released in 2002 to the public and everybody can actually use it and mess around with the code and fine tune the model such that we can do novel tasks. Um, there has been a few um, different diffusion-based models that does text-to-image synthesis. Um, one is Imagen from Google, and the other one is DALI2 from OpenAI. This can do also similar thing as stable diffusion model. However, uh, while many people are is not able to use this because it's not released to the public and we don't have the code, we can get the result using their API, um, especially for DALI2. However, um, for Imagen or any other uh, diffusion model that is developed in a big tech company, it's mostly um, closed door, so we cannot use it. So one natural thing we can think about it um, for stable diffusion is then, oh, why won't we just train our new model using our cluster GPUs and training data set? However, this model is actually really, really expensive. So how expensive it is, is that I'm gonna cover it next. So first of all, um, the model is actually funded by a company called uh, Stability AI. Thus the name is Stable Diffusion, okay? So it's not about the stability of the Stable Diffusion model. I mean, it's really stable. However, I believe it's the name Stable comes from the Stability AI company name. And for the data set, in order to train this, uh, they use a Lion, 5B data set, so it's like 5 billion uh, pair data set, which is almost, uh, when I quickly search it out, was around uh, 250 terabytes. So that's a really big data to start off. And how they train this, um, using how many GPUs they used in this model is that um, they used 256 NVIDIA A100 GPU. So A100 GPU has like 90 giga um, GPU memory. So that's a really huge model. And the training time is, really huge also. It's gonna take around 24 days using the 256 NVIDIA A100 GPU. And if you um, measure this um, to convert this into a price, uh, you'll roughly get part of one as a model. So this is really important, expensive. And I don't believe this includes the uh, labor fee. So the model itself, itself is uh, like, yeah, 600K dollars, so really expensive. So it's really hardly unlikely to be done in a small research group in our lab. So 
but then uh, Stability AI made this uh, public to the um, for the researchers or any other community to use it and um, do whatever they want to do with it. So that's a good thing. So that's why it got very popular and many people are diving into this field. So what is then um, stable diffusion made of? So stable diffusion is built upon a paper called high resolution image synthesis with latent diffusion model. And this paper is actually published in last year's TVPR. And what it does is that um, given a pre-trained encoder and a decoder, um, like here, uh, you can actually reconstruct the image. And what encoder can actually do is that you can put the image X into the latent space of a pre like some generative model, right? And then um, in order to train this um, diffusion model, what they do is that, oh, they send this latent code Z um, to a really noisy space such that it will be a random Gaussian. And then in the denoising process, they just iteratively denoise little by little um, with, given, uh, with a given condition um, such as semantic map, text, other representation, and it can be image or maybe a parametric space or any sort. So you can do whatever you want here. Um, however, the most important part here is definitely the diffusion process. But this diffusion process, when in their paper, they didn't really explain a lot about the uh, architecture design. However, if you look into the code, it's really complicated. But however, to simply put, they just use a unit architecture with cross-attention and self-attention mechanism in all of the layers. All right. So after training this model, uh, what you can um, simplify this diagram into like this pictures. So given a text prompt and a noisy latent code, noisy latent code, you can you pass it through the unit uh, with a time step t and do this for uh, capital T times and then pass it through a decoder to generate a um, image here. So this will be like unrolling those um, diffusion process here. And then you can actually uh, fine tune this model to do in painting task where the, the previous method is just unconditional. So you don't know, you don't have a uh, guidance of what the geometric structure would be except for the text prompt. So what you can do for in-painting task, you take the uh, pre-trained model from the stable diffusion and then put additional uh, input in the, uh, in the into the unit. So here, since it's a in-painting task, you have to preserve the uh, background information. You give a mask image as an input also and a, a mask that needs to be filled out by the diffusion process. So. Uh, I'm not sure about the details on how to train this uh, in-painting model. However, they put, uh, they just take the pre-trained model from the stable, the original stable diffusion, and then add simple few layers in the front of the unit, and then uh, fine tune for a little bit to do this task. And as you can see um, now, um, the background is similar, uh, just actually the same as before. However, um, the foreground object is different. Um, and it's, um, this foreground object is guided by this um, text prompt in, on the top. So it's really simple. Okay, so easy. So if you have any question, by the way, uh, you can stop me in the middle. And I think this is like the first part of table, uh, like the presentation. So I think it's a good point to uh, maybe get some questions. Yeah, so to produce the output, so you need to, uh provide an input like this. So what if oh, yeah. the input image does not contain the dog here? Sorry, the, what so if it, the input? Yeah, is it required to uh, provide an input uh, such a way, uh, such an uh, image as an input? Um, For the in-painting task, um, yes, you need this uh, four inputs, like text prompt, mask image, mask, and the noise. Uh, maybe it could be uh, three because you only need the original image and the mask and then the text. Yeah. And for the unconditional rotation model, um, you actually only need the text prompt here. Uh, okay, okay. Uh, so if you go back to the previous example again. Uh... Yep, yep. 
uh, okay, so here dog is pro provided, but then the user wants to have a, a face of a yellow cat. Okay, but then uh, sitting on a park bench is remain the same, right? Yep. That's uh, yeah. So should it match? I guess that was my question. Uh, oh. Oh, the contents of the original background oh, image uh, and uh, the uh, description uh, of the, uh, yes. okay. So yeah, um, to perform, to get good results, it usually have to match with the original like scene description. However, you don't really have to put um, sitting on a park bench um, to say, but you might get a different result or you might even get a good result. It's just random chance, but usually um, when you train this diffusion model, um, the text prompt and the given image are usually paired. So it's better to have a really good scene description. And that's one of the uh, main bottleneck of this text uh, guided image synthesis method. You have to have a really uh, long sentences to get good results or engineer those sentences to get good results. So in this case for the in-painting uh, task, can I simply say I like to have a yellow cap instead of a dog? Yep, um, that could happen. And that would actually synthesize a yellow cat. Yeah, so- But uh, it wouldn't so be, it might not be sitting on the bench. Oh, even if your input image is, is a bench in the park. Oh yeah, the bench will be synthesized and in-painted. However, the cat might be located on top of the bench. Um... So since we define this um, text prompt as a sitting on a park bench, um, it's highly likely to put the cat on the uh, sitting area. However, if you just put cats, uh, I believe one possibility is that the cat will be sitting on the, uh, it's not the head part, but like the upper part of the bench. Yeah, for, for this um, in-painting task, ma mask is provided. Mm -hmm. So the, the, that means the sitting area for the cat will be already implicitly determined. So starting from yeah. the mask, yeah, masking area, it will be located there, I assume. So in this yep. case, since the background information is already provided in the image, so what, do we have to provide the uh, background information in the text? Because um, even if you don't provide it as a text, the, mm -hmm. the image background already contains information. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So you don't really have to uh, provide the uh, scene description. Okay, okay. I think, uh, um, it, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a question. So it, it is kind of, what is it? Um, how do I say evaluation task? Like how, how do we get the results? Well, we're gonna use like, okay, inference task maybe. Uh, I'm just curious about like, uh, in this condition of like training, it, it, isn't it kind of, a uh, high possibility that even though the bench is generated based on the condition image, but the, the bench might be the different shape from the original condition. Is it happening? Mm -hmm. um, the details might be a little bit different, but usually the geometric structure is really similar to the original uh, background image. So I'm just curious about when I see every diffusion paper, how do they optimize the result like in previous convolution based method they are using loss terms to compare maybe in some kind of unpaired condition or in paired condition but in this procedure uh like they're not used much what is it optimization procedure uh even if even the other papers i, I just see that they are relying on the pre-chained performance and uh, they're not using much loss terms as the result image. Uh, do you know the reason why? Like, So today I'm gonna cover one method that just you pre-train diffusion model and another method that actually uh, fine tunes the diffusion model. Uh -huh. So one reason why, as I said, um, in order to fine tune the diffusion model, you need a really huge cluster of GPUs. Okay. So that's a, first of all, really huge bottleneck. And then usually uh, for this kind of guided task, you uh -huh. need to have, you need to uh, somehow gather 
or synthesize like a paired data set. So for example, like for this example, uh, in order to make this in painting text guided in painting to work, you need a you need to have a paired text to image data set. So if you don't have have one, uh, you have to either make one or gather it somehow or just come up with a really uh, genius problem. But I think the first um, problem is the biggest. You need a huge cluster of GPUs. Okay, I see. But um, there's some other method that does meet only one GPU or maybe four GPUs uh, in a moderate level. However, um, yeah, I think that's possible for now, but uh, maybe that could be covered in a different seminar or talk later on. Okay. So any other oh, questions? I, I, I have one question. Yep. So when the image is putting into flip encoder, then the record it, it is possible to reconstructing that image or just generate similar image of that concept. Mm. So yeah, the second part of the talk will be about that. And ah, ah, okay, okay. what I'm assuming is that um when you just use a pre-trained uh, model, uh, it is highly unlikely to generate the, uh, what is it? Highly unlikely to um, reconstruct the image. Like suppose like in this scenario, I think the most stochasticity comes from this noise latent vector, latent code. And this just does this uh, text prompt or since it is clip, you have an image encoder and you can put images, however, First of all, there is like a slight difference between image embedding and text embedding. So that's a little bit of problem. And the second problem is usually the diffusion, like denoising diffusion process where there has a lot of stochasticity. So it wouldn't likely to generate um, reconstructed images just using, by putting the image into the clip encoder. Thank you. All right. So, yeah, I have covered about stable diffusion and I promise um, two paper will be presented, but it's already uh, 15 minutes past, but uh, I'll be fast as possible. So the first paper I brought you is blended latent diffusion from, um, I don't know how to pronounce this name, Avrahami. And this work is done jointly from Hebrew University of Jerusalem and Whiteman University from Israel. And I guess um, this will be presented in this year's paper as a journal craft paper. So as you can see from this uh, top figure, what it does is that um, given an input image and an input mask and a text prompt, you can edit um, the images just like this. So in the text description, it says a man with a yellow sweatshirt, then the diffusion process automatically generates this uh, yellow sweatshirt seamlessly. So let's get into, into the details. The area is not as accurate as it can be. So it contains the black area. So mask does not have to be accurate, I guess. Oh yeah, mask doesn't have to be accurate. That's true. Okay. So user has to just scribble the areas and then, yeah, you can just use that as an input here. So let's look at the overview of the blended latent diffusion model. So as I said, there's three inputs. First input is the text prompt, and the second is image, and the third one is a rough mask. You first um, take the image and encode it to the latent space of a autoencoder, and we'll call that C in it. So if you put C in it and Z in it to the decoder, it would reconstruct the original image. But here, since we try to edit, uh, we're just going to use this as just a guidance. And then we also need to downsample the original mask to the lower resolution because it has, we're going to use this later mask, uh, mask as a um, compositing algorithm in the later slide. OK, first, since we have the Z in it, uh, we can put additional noise to make a Z that's T. So this is just a random Gaussian noise. And then you can take this input that T 
to the denoising process and get a set T minus one. And this will be guided with the above text pump, a huge avocado. So it will not, we will think it would need to generate an avocado within this um, um, latent code. But since we need to preserve the original background, what we do is that in the lower part, we just take the Z in it and then move this Z in it to the Z T minus one. This can be just um, computed with the mathematic equation from the diffusion process paper. And I won't explain that um, in details here. However, why we do this is because in order to um, generate a composited image of a given image and the generated image, uh, we need to match the uh, noise distribution at the time step T. So that's why we um, put the additional noise in the Z in it. And then after that, uh, we combine this VT minus one foreground and the background image that we just computed and compose it using the downsampled uh, mass image. And then you get a new ZT minus one. And since we are just um, getting rid of noise iteratively, like one step at a time, we do this for like capital T times. Here, I think we they use like 50 times or Maybe it could be thousand or any other number that the user wants to do. So and then after, yeah, oh, T represents, yeah, go ahead. represents mm -hmm. the time step. Yeah, T represents the time step. So, so why is it going backward from T to T minus one, T minus two, and then zero? So, so we're assuming that the T uh, set to zero is the original, like the natural latent code, and the set T would be the the noisy version of it, like not the noisy version of it, but an actual Gaussian distributed noise latent code. And I'm not sure like why they did this in a reverse order, but the original paper did that and then everyone is just following it with it. And so yeah, you, if you reverse the order, it will be the same. It's just about the yeah ordering of the number here. Well, so it's going from T to zero. All right, then after that, um, you did this for T time, and then you get a latent code Z that will represent the edited image, and then you pass it through a decoder to render the final image. And as you can see, you can have a nat not natural, but a really kind of realistic looking avocado in the bottom of the uh, floor here. Yeah, I'm just Our, yeah. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. yeah. If you can play with this code, I'm just wondering if you just put uh, avocado instead of a huge avocado, I'm wondering if the result would be different or not. Because it will be different. Huge means, I mean, our perception. So it just avocado will be placed with in the in the mask area. Mm, true. Yeah. So I think it would definitely uh, produce a different avocado images if you just erase the huge part. Uh, and also, if you just use different um, noise samples, it would lead to different images also. So it might not actually reflect the uh, text prompt that you have given, even though you have said, uh, I want a huge avocado, uh, it might actually um, generate a really small avocado. So it depends on the random noise that you inject to the diffusion process. All right, so however, there's some limitation when you just use this algorithm is that um, after um, editing, you lose some details. When I say um, it loses the details, it usually loses high frequency details around the, for example, around the eyes and the teeth of, of Joe, President Joe Biden. Um, so we need another mechanism to reconstruct, reconstruct this well. But however, um, this is not to the fact uh, due, it's not, um, this doesn't happen because of the diffusion process, but this is the one of the limitation of the variation of autoencoder model, where you're compressing the image into the uh, compressed um, representation and convert it back to the original image space. So that's, um, this is due to the variation of autoencoder model. And then in order to 
in order to um, um, re uh, relieve this problem, you can take two steps. One is to actually um, optimize the generated latent code, CO, such that it will produce a um, natural looking and accurately reconstructed images. And another approach is to um, fine tune the decoder model. So oh. when you um, optimize the encoder, you have this um, energy function to reconstruct the, reconstruct the foreground image and the background image to be accurate. And by taking the same equation, we just um, take a different optimization approach where you're now optimizing for the network weight. So they have tried out these two processes. And then what they found out is that um, optimizing the latent code itself doesn't really work that well. As you can see, the T source is not that well reconstructed in this case. However, when you optimize the decoder part of the autoencoder, you can see the now the T's and the hairlines are much more realistic and accurate. And additionally, um, sometimes people might uh, usually thin mask to begin with to edit the images. But however, since we're resizing the source mask into a smaller version to be operated in the latent space, um, it might lose some details and um, it, in the end, it might not reflect the text editing from, as you can see in the middle of the image. However, we they, so, so they propose a progressive mask shrinking algorithm where they, um, for every each step, uh, in the beginning, they have a really huge mask and uh, reduced down to the original image mask in the diffusion process. Then after that, after using this mask shrinking operation, you can see that the um, edited image is well replied. So to sum, to sum up, um, in the blended latent diffusion model, um, they have proposed um, three R three um, contributions. The first one is to use a algorithm to, to guide the denoising diffusion process for the editing. And the second one is for accurate reconstruction or of the original content. And then for handling the thin mass, they propose a progressive shrinking of, um, of the mass. Um, yeah, to do it. So here's some results. So given the input image in the left um, and the mass on the second column, you can generate um, the editing result. It somehow kind of knows like how to blend um, the foreground image to the generated image. As you can see, the upper man, the torso is now kind of reconstructed, reconstructed. However, since it doesn't know like how it should be posed, um, sometimes the man is actually crossing his arm and sometimes it's just um, laying his hand down. And also for the um, other cases, where you put um, beach, big mountains, and pyramid, um, you can see that the background composition is actually really well blended with the foreground images. And here's another result. Because I said that the latent, uh, the, the diffusion process, we can inject random noise. With different random noise, you can generate different kinds of rock images. For example, in the prediction one, two, three, you put different noise injection and you can get different uh, different rock composition. And also what you, additionally, what you can do is to do image to image translation. Uh, however, they didn't put it, uh, much details in this part. However, this is also possible. And there, there is some other works that does similar thing to edit images with text form. And they compare with uh, paint by word and glide filter. But as you can see from the second column, um, the generated image doesn't really look that natural. Um, the identity of Mona Lisa or Joe, President Joe Biden is um, kind of corrupted. And also for glide filters, um, you can see the edited region is now really not well reflected for the thin um, mask region. And in order to evaluate this kind of method, um, what they did is that uh, they have some um, precision metric where um, they measure the edited image and the text form um, in the um, clip space. And they also measure the diversity of how much um, um, diversified image that can be generated using LPIP score. And additionally, what we can um, highly um, do for this kind of images is just using user study. 
and they conducted user study with the perceptual metric and text image matching. So for the perceptual metric, what they're measuring, what they ask for is that um, they're asking the user to um, test whether, um, measure whether this image list looks natural or not, and they're comparing with their method and the other method. So if you can see um, for live feature, um, live feature actually outperforms our their blended latent diffusion model. However, when you measure the text uh, matching score where the text form matches the edited image, um, light doesn't really um, get good scores and blended diffusion outperforms it. So yep, yeah, that's for the blended diffusion model, blended latent diffusion model. And now I will describe another paper that does kind of similar thing, but in a different manner. Um, it's a paper called paint by example. So here, what they do is instead of giving a text prompt as an input as before, uh, we can use our images as an input into the clip um, encoder. So here, what they do is, is in painting, but instead of giving text, they give this reference image on the top here. So I, as I said, um, instead of text, yeah, it's giving exemplar image and the process is almost similar as the um, stable diffusion in painting method. However, um, in order to do this kind of test, there is a lot of challenges. First challenge is that uh, you actually need to get a bunch of data, actually triplet data that contains source image, exemplar image, and the corresponding edited image. Because this kind of um, data set is almost impossible to get, this is the first challenge. And the second challenge is that the image encoder or the clip encoder have to understand what the image should be look like when synthesized. So that's another challenge. And after compositing, the object should be really natural, such as the pose might have to change and the size might have to change. And also the original illumination of the background image should match to the synthesized image. And additionally, it also has to paint the invisible region behind the object. So because of these challenges, um, um, this is a really difficult task. However, stable diffusion kind of allowed this, but in order to make this possible, they actually fine tune the stable diffusion model. So um, in order to fine tune the model, first we need to um, gather data set. One, one naive way to gather data set is just to use a bounding box um, example. So for given a input, image, um, you can just take the bounding box as a mass random mass representation and crop that and resize it such that it, this, would, this image could be passed through the um, clip image encoder. And then the final result should be the original target images. However, when using this kind of data set, it kind of quickly overfits to the training data set. And when um, tested on a test sample, it kind of copy and paste the original exemplar image. Um, so that's a problem. So in order to um, alleviate this issue, um, they looked into the clip image encoder space. Um, when you embed the image using clip encoder, it actually can, it produces one class tokens and uh, 256 patch tokens. So they assume that um, this, this um, tokens are too much information such that um, it, the diffusion process kind of cheats um, the training process. So in order to alleviate that, they just add a really strong bottleneck in the clip encoder. So instead of using the 256 patch encoder, they um, erase those parts and only use the one class token, such that um, it will compress all the semantic information to a uh, one representation. And additionally, um, to avoid, some, avoid a simple um, composition, um, what they did is that it is essential to apply really strong augmentation such that it will lose the geometric information while uh, remaining the semantic, um, semantics of the origin. And additionally, what they did is that um, instead of using just bounding box, people might actually use a random scribbles or random um, polygons of the mask. So they kind of augment the um, original bounding box such that it could be a polygon. And this is the 
overall process. So I have um, explained how we generate data set and then how we make the math and then how we augment this. And they additionally put this MLP and freeze the clip in image encoder and only fine tune the diffusion model here. So in order to train this, they gather data set from open images, at, which includes 1.9 million um, images with 60 million bounding boxes. And then start off with the fine tuning process of a, a stable diffusion image and painting model. And the training time um, is around 40 epochs, which takes around set four days on a 24 NVIDIA 300. So this is also quite costly um, setting. So this is some results. So given the input image on the top and the mask image on the bottom and an example image here, you can generate this kind of fancy images. And also uh, you can erase this uh, up here to generate a Eiffel Tower, uh, not Eiffel Tower, what is it? Yeah, <laughs> I forgot the name of it, Liberty something. But anyway, the most imp interesting, yeah, yeah. So however, like, what I want to emphasize from this image is that, you know, like from the original image, you can see some um, shadows below here, right? And because this is kind of a cue of where the light direction is coming from. So the um, synthesized uh, Liber Statue of Liberty actually has those lighting conditions to be generated and matches the original, uh, what is it, shadow. So I think that's a really impressive impressive thing that I have observed. And also you can do other things. You can put castles in the moon and make this um, old car into a really fancy sports car. Yeah, here's more example. And um, they compare with other um, baseline methods. Obviously one of the baseline methods would be using stable diffusion. Um, to in-paint the missing region. However, since I'm not described accurately the wanted um, reference image, um, it's highly unlikely to generate this, uh, um, this kind of, uh, what is it? Um, uh, yeah, target, target reference image. And also they compare with image harmonization method. However, since image harmonization doesn't really change the overall structure of the geometry and doesn't like cast shadows or lighting, um, this looks kind of unnatural and other methods also kind of fail. Here, um, they actually measure the FID score and QS score and QS score actually measures the real list of the images and the clip scores just compares the um, exemplar image to and the synthesized image such, you know, cosine similarity. And you can see um, compared to the other baseline method, um, paint by example method outperforms the old. And this figure shows some um, ablation study of the method. So when I, the first example I showed um, in the naive implementation, you can see it's kind of copy and pasting the original image as you can see. And if you use a uh, pre-trained model to begin with, um, it kind of improves the quality. However, it's still copy and pasted. And if you start to augment the image such that it would lose some geometric information, uh, you can see it kind of changes the structure. However, it's still limited. And if you add additional uh, bottleneck into the clip encoder, now you can see that all the, uh, all the geometric structure is like erased and it kind of understands the semantics such that it would compose it uh, in a natural manner. And then they additionally um, propose a classifier free guidance here. However, I didn't explain this. However, if you use this, um, you can get much better results in the end. So to wrap it up, um, today I presented um, three papers. The first one was stable diffusion, a really powerful text to image generation model. And using that, um, people have investigated how to use this model for image editing tasks. And the first method, blended latent diffusion uses a pre-trained um, stable diffusion model without any training pro process. And they use their um, algorithm to simply composite the generated one and the original background image. And in the paint by example, they take another, another approach to fine tune the model such that it would take um, 
take example image instead of the text one. So what I want to, uh, what I understand from reading a lot of stable diffusion paper is that stable diffusion has a really nice understanding of the image composition and layout and overall geometric structure. So if you need to like uh, um, synthesize natural looking images, I think stable diffusion is a really nice uh, model to use in the end. All right. Um, thank you for listening to my seminar today. It was kind of messy. However, um, um, if you have any questions, you can ask me right now. Thank you. Uh, I have a just a, what is a very coarse idea. Yeah. Like some maybe a lot of diffusion models. Like I think many diffusion models are trying to optimizing their images on very what is it. A stable way. I, I don't know how do I explain it, but I'm just curious about, about like, uh, are they ab able to or to optimize their output to the input by like maybe some cyclic way or, uh, mm -hmm. for example, let's say if I am trying to make the face based on the input text, and I'm giving the condition face. So I just want to edit the face based on the input text, but I want to keep the uh, like landmark of the input face to the output. It means that I want to keep the, what is it, the shape of the face. In that case, how about like I extract the landmark from the output image and compare the landmark to the input image that I use for the training. They maybe make the sense in very previous model based on convolutions, but how do you think about in diffusion? It will be work or? Um, so you know, uh, I will rephrase your question if I understand correctly. Um, so you're asking whether this kind of um, condition would work with diffusion model, is that correct? Yeah. Like conditioning just, landmark. Yeah, okay. yeah. So yeah, I think, any condition should work ideally. And there's a lot of methods that actually try to propose those kind of methods. Like I think one of the like most popular method that was proposed was called control net, where they can put any control um uh, okay. it's not input. about the question about control net because uh like let's say uh like control net is like uh implementing the condition to the input task and try to make the result uh influenced by the condition uh, uh, my question is that like uh not using the additional condition like let's say if i only have uh, just one input and i just want to make the model to keep the shape of the input but in that way uh, like we know that we don't have a exact ground truth, but in some cases they are making the exact ground truth by making a self constructive way. But if we don't have, we at least have to uh, cyclic way to compare the output and the input image. But I don't see like which kind of those implementation in the diffusion area. And I was curious why are why they are not trying it. Um, so, so I think the question would be then, uh, why don't we use, uh, so for, I think the assumption here is, um, using a unconditional, like text guided generation model. Um, uh -huh. and then in order to like optimize for certain geometric structure, why don't we use like cyclic concept or any other concept that does like, um, that kind of generate those desired images. So yeah, I haven't I haven't able to see like optimization based method where they use cyclic losses here because the property of diffusion model is to uh, predict the next noisy image, uh, next denoise image one at a time. So in order to do cyclic on conditioning, it's kind of hard to do it if you do the diffusion process for the whole uh, 50 steps or 1,000 steps, that would take a few seconds or even a few minutes. 
And then if you do another path of cyclic um, path to do cyclic uh, consistency, then you might need additional, like you have to double the time. So one optimization step would take at least a few minutes to do it. So I think that's um, why um, it's kind of hard to use a cyclic consistency in diffusion model. However, I have seen some paper um, that tries to uh, guide the diffusion process by um, training a really small module such that it will follow some structures. It's different from control net. So what they do is that um, it's like um, what Guan is doing, is doing scratch extraction. However, they add additional model um, in the um, in the unit structure such that it would generate some kind of um, edge images. And then they use those edge images to back propagate the diffusion process such that um, you would um, synthesize those geometric structure given the text. So there's some method, however, uh, I think it's really hard to come up with um, right now for cyclic consistency. Okay, I see. I'm wondering this uh, diffusion model can also handle outpainting. Uh, oh, it can actually well. handle outpainting no quite problem. nicely. Nicely. Yeah. Uh, okay, but yeah. traditionally with a tra uh, traditional analytic method, outpainting is considered much harder than in painting because it doesn't have boundary. Yeah, but then yeah. in this case, I don't see any reason that uh, this learning-based method cannot handle outpainting. So that's why I was asking. So, so although you didn't have an example here, so you say outpainting can be easily handled. Yeah, outpainting can be easily handled and it is using the, what is it? image and painting method by stable diffusion. So in this example, like the holes are inside, but for our painting, you can make the holes outside, right? And then you can just um, iteratively it really, like expand the region to do our painting. It works really nice with images and there's a lot of way to do uh, our painting. However, um, for, for this moment, I haven't seen any paper that handles videos and videos using diffusion model I, um, is extremely difficult. And people are now kind of investigating and they are proposing a way to do, um, to use diffusion model for video editing or video generation task. However, um, there's, I believe there's a long way to go still to, to be more naturally looking. Yeah, I guess it can be a very interesting research direction. Okay. Yeah. Any, Any other question? Yes, can I have a question? Um, I think this is quite awesome to like um, um, the global illumination or image layout. Um, how is it possible? <laughs> I, yeah, how is it possible? How do you think it? Uh, the short answer would be this. Figure, how where is it? Uh, the short answer is cost you got one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because um, yeah, to be more um, um, well, I think I don't have an answer for sure. I don't have a really clear answer, but. I'm not sure why, to begin with, I'm not sure why diffusion work model works really well, to be honest. But I kind of have an understanding why um, it kind of outperforms um, StyleGAN method. Uh, one reason why it kind of outperforms StyleGAN is that StyleGAN is, um, the data set is really important and the overall layout structures and the training schemes are uh, super important. And if you do not do it well, um, it quickly um, diverges for the GAN itself. So that's why people kind of align those data sets such that it would make the net, your network to train easily. However, in diffusion process, 
we don't operate in the latent space. I mean, we operate in the latent space, but we still kind of have these geometric structures. And then we don't really need to be constrained in the um, GAN training process where we have a really unstable discriminator. We only have one loss that, and the only one loss that they give is the denoising, task, denoising term. So I think that's why it kind of results in a really stable training. And maybe uh, that's why it um, can generate a diverse set of images. And since it's trained with a really huge data set and a model, I think that's why uh, it kind of outperforms the other like GAN-based methods and even generate like realistic looking composited images. Yeah, and it's 5 billion images is a really huge data set. So the network should learn something from it for sure. Any other questions? If not, um, thank you for listening um, and I'll end my presentation for today.